Okay, good, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, we are delighted to have you uh, join us for our second film and Q&A in our Democracy Film Series that's sponsored by Simply Living and the Ohio Community Rights Network. Um, so first of all, uh, we'd love to know who's uh, joining us. So if you could put uh, where you're from in the chat, uh, that would be great. We, we think that we've got people from a wide uh, range of uh, places. So um, we will uh, first, uh, I'd like uh, Chuck Lynn is here and uh, They'll say uh, what Simply Living is, who they are, and then I'll explain who the Ohio Community Rights Network is, and then we'll get started with our Q&A introduction to our, our guest here. So, Chuck? I'm Chuck Land, and I'm, with, uh, I'm a founding board member of a 29-year-old organization called Simply Living. We started out mostly about lifestyle changes and how people can uh, pay attention to their ecological footprint and uh, the impact of their food and transportation and energy use and recycling, et cetera. And we've evolved over the years to recognize that uh, policies are also critical. And if, as we realized that uh, much of our work uh, in localizing, uh, and we did a lot of work with local economy work, we realized that corporations were influencing the agencies that we were trying to get reforms or regulations to happen, which is, I'm sure you noticed in the, in the film, it's a big theme, the captured agency issue and the ability to get response from the Environmental Protection Agency or many other agencies that uh, are basically run by lobbyists, et cetera. So uh, a number of us in, in uh, Simply Living have become uh, activists regarding the issue of uh, uh, localization versus the global corporate interest, which uh, are dominating the issues around fracking and those sorts of issues that we all are here and aware of. Uh, but our theme is sort of let you can make all your all of our communities more resilient, more sustainable if we localize and rebuild our local food systems, our uh, lo take care of our local. Uh, restaurants or local businesses, the ones that are locally owned that keep money in the community. And that's a strength that strengthens our ability to take a bite out of the global economy by building up our local economy. So we're an ally of the Ohio Community Rights Network because we really feel strongly that uh, their, of course, their mission is at the heart of this issue. And I'll turn it over to Bill. Yeah, thanks, Chuck. Yeah, the Ohio Community Rights Network started in 2013 officially as an organization and it's comprised of community groups throughout Ohio in about 10 plus counties and of course we would love to grow more and more counties uh, that uh, with these groups have uh, worked on advancing community rights and rights of nature in their communities tirelessly through many hours of work petitioning and uh, speaking and, uh, and so forth. So um, that's uh, who our organization is and, and uh, just a real brief introduction there. And uh, we are delighted to have with us uh, Marky Miller from Toledoans for Safe Water, who you uh, saw in the film, and um, Tish O'Dell, who's the CELDEF organizer for the Ohio Community Rights Network or for Ohio, and also a member of the Ohio Community Rights Network. And uh, we're here to talk about the film. I hope you really uh, enjoyed and uh, you know, uh, learned a lot from the film. And if you have questions, feel free to put those in the, in the chat. And also just want to mention that if you would like to donate to our uh, organizations and you didn't get a chance, you can. Uh, at the uh, link to our Democracy Film Series, there's a button for donations, and we are sharing them equally between our two organizations. So thank you very much for that. Uh, so I'd like to start out with a few questions, and uh, then we'll uh, open it up maybe for uh, questions coming from the, the chat or the Q&A. Uh, 
So I guess uh, maybe we'll start with Marky here. Can you explain uh, what is meant exactly by rights of nature? Even though we've just seen a movie about it, when something is new and the rights of nature ideas is fairly new uh, as a concept, but it's, it's accelerating very fast around the world. Uh, it takes time for any new idea to be internalized. And sometimes we need multiple explanations to formulate this idea in, in our minds. So can you give your uh, explanation of what is rights of nature? What do we mean? Yeah, sure. And I, I think it's one of those things that we, we like understand with our gut right away, um, but maybe don't know how to talk about it up front. So it takes a little time to, to learn how to verbalize it. But rights of nature is a concept rooted in traditional ecological knowledge that today offers this emerging legal framework to secure protections for natural systems through a recognition that nature has this inalienable right to exist, flourish, and thrive. And in doing this, we, we recognize as well that ecosystems and natural communities aren't just property that can be used and damaged and destroyed by whoever holds ownership over them and they can you know use it as they see fit. But it's, it's in this clash with our current system that we create conflict and that conflict creates the changes we need to undergo in order to make those legal shifts and the cultural shifts as well. Um, and I think there's, there's so much more I could say about it, but I'm hoping more of that kind of emerges in the conversation. So I will, mm -hmm. I'll leave it there and we can expand on that as we go. Yeah, sure. Well, let me, uh, first of all, uh, why is rights of nature important for democracy, Tish? <laughs> oh, oh, you're just starting off with some real big ones. Yeah, I know. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> that's what we're all um, working for with our group, as well as like Chuck talking about local, uh, uh, keeping it local, lo local self-governance is one of the things right. that we're working towards. So why is rights of nature a mm -hmm. part of our group and important for that? Right. And, you know, uh, Marky mentioned, some, you know, a lot of this, it's such a huge shift in our thinking. So it's a cultural shift, you know, and rights of nature um, recognizes the rights of all life on earth. So, of course, this is connected to social justice issues and democracy. You know, if we protect water, air, soil, and say that, you know, like what Marky had said, the environment, nature has these rights to be clean and healthy, and we recognize that humans also have this right and the access to this healthy environment, you know, you can see that then there would be no more sacrifice zones, right, for corporate profits and greed. So again, part of that interconnectedness that we need to, you know, we've been, our, our culture and capitalism has been so good at severing that connectedness. And so bringing that back together you know, and um, a lot of indigenous people, activists like Vandana Shiva, they speak a lot about this. And so who better to protect the local environment and nature in the local community than the people who live there, you know, in a specific community or a bio region. And that connects directly to the community rights strategy and movement, because as we've grown and spread the message, I guess, and exposed the system that tries to strip this local decision making and protecting the local environment, and this is both in Ohio and all over the country, we've seen this. We've seen the status quo in the system try to squash these efforts, you know, and you saw it in the film with both Toledo and with the Grant Township case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely tied, just like we're tied and connected to nature. This is all tied to democracy. Yeah, you mentioned Vandana Shiva, and she talks about that we uh, have been living uh, in our society too often in eco-apartheid. That we see ourselves separate from nature and uh, we have to see ourselves of what we really are as, as a part of nature um yeah so uh why either one of you is the uh recognition of the rights of nature so important especially at this point in time and why is it this concept spreading throughout the world well i think you know we see things getting worse not better and for me, it's it's like, it, what's your breaking point that you say, I think we need to do something differently. And you wonder about what your future is going to look like. You know, we have a strong youth movement around climate change because 
a lot of people don't know what kind of future they're in for. And yet we're sort of going along the same way, like, yeah, go ahead, get a degree, get a career, start a family. And those things don't feel as certain to a lot of people right now. So I, I see this as just a new path. And one, like, like I said, you feel it in your gut. You just know there's something right about this. And I can do what I know is going to get me where I know it's going to get me right going through the regulatory process. I know where that's going to lead. Um, and although there's no promises with rights of nature as it stands right now, at least I know I'm trying something different that has a chance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and I think, we're, well, I was going to just add to that. Sure. I think, and what we're seeing is, you know, like Grant Township Toledo are the two examples in the film, but it's very obvious this is happening everywhere where the regulatory system, you know, the whole idea before it was all about, you know, dilution is the solution. <laughs> And it's like, well, it's so obvious, like, it's kind of hard to like say that, you know, that's working anymore. Right? <laughs> I mean, and it's affecting people everywhere, whereas before maybe it was only in some of those places that were considered the sacrifice zones, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas Now it seems to be impacting, you know, because we know that that's not the solution. And so it, it, the environment and nature can't dilute our pollution anymore. And so it's hitting a lot more people at home. And it's much more difficult to deny that the system's working. Well, when I, when I mentioned about it spreading throughout the world, and the film mentions uh, uh, some of some of it, I think, but um, that current, so there's some current uh, rights of nature efforts, uh, and some of them, a couple I know about that you've been involved with, Tish. Uh, one is there's been uh, some conferences that uh, about, uh, and one of them you spoke at, about the EU adopting rights of nature, considering adopting rights of nature. And then also, I know you've been involved with some other efforts in Ohio, so maybe you can share a little bit about that with us and any other efforts that either one of you know about currently. Yeah, I was really, um, it, it was a great experience. It was um, Marie Toussaint actually put on this. She's a member of the EU parliament and it just ended this past week um, with the final conference, but it was a series, I think of four webinars and I was um, on one of them, which was about human rights and rights of nature. So because in our culture, right, people always think that if we give nature rights, that's going to diminish human rights. And that all gets back to the interconnectedness. And I don't really think so. I mean, it may diminish rights of corporations, but I don't think it's going to diminish rights of humans. It's actually going to expand them. Um, but yeah, the rights of nature movements definitely uh, I like to say it's a train that's left the station, so to speak, <laughs> and it's really popular right now. Um, and I think we need, we're at a place where we need to be careful that it doesn't get co-opted and watered down so it loses any real meaningful impact. You know, we don't want it to turn into one of those cultural fad things that everybody's like, mm. oh, of nature. Um, but yeah, it's definitely, so in, in Europe, there were to, that whole conference and what she's involved in is about um, implementing rights of nature at like the parliament level and what would that actually mean and look like. And so they talked about ecocide as making mm. time um, was one of the topics as well. You know, and again, we're at that place where it, yeah, like what Marky said, everybody gets it in their gut. Like they understand kind of what rights of nature means, but they don't know how to quite implement it. Like, how is this going to actually look? And so that's where we're at now. And, um, and I would say indigenous people, you know, for them, it, we can learn from them and we're in communication with a lot of them, but their whole culture is so different from ours. And so like for them, even the idea of granting nature rights is foreign. And that's like a foreign concept. That's our Western culture. We put everything in terms of rights. Um, but on the other hand, you know, we, it's trying to merge these two and figure out how it'll work. So it's evolving. And I'm really excited because some of the communities that we're working with at CELDEF, we're trying to take it to the next level. So taking like what Toledo did and what Grant's doing with the, both theirs and the Lake Erie Bill of Rights, and let's move that to the next level. Let's expand on the enforcement, what that mm -hmm. could look like. And so I'm working with communities in Ohio and Cincinnati um, they're very concerned about the Ohio River. Yeah. You know, Lake Erie at the northern part of our state, and then the Ohio River is our southern border. And 
some of you may have even seen the other Mark Ruffalo film, the Dark Waters film, and that talked about, um, you know, the Ohio River and a lot of the pollution down there. So talk to them. We've, um, I've been talking to people in Niagara, New York. They're very interested. Lake Erie obviously meets um, the Niagara River. Mm. So they see the connection there and Niagara Falls. And it's just, I mean, I'm talking, we're talking to people with cell death all over. I mean, Florida, Arizona, Mississippi, about rights of the Mississippi. Um, people in Nova Scotia, very concerned about deforestation um, going on up there. And we saw that Canada just passed recently um, the rights of the Magpie River. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yeah, this is definitely something that's spreading and growing. And we just have to be really careful that we don't let it get co-opted so that it actually continues to move forward and do what we need it to do. Yeah. Yeah. Aren't they just to, to refresh my memory? Uh, and if, if I'm missing some, but we know that there's been rights of nature uh, provisions adopted in what New Zealand, Australia, uh, Ecuador, Bolivia, India. Uh, let's see. Um, the other countries I'm missing there, there must be a few others, I think. I don't know if Nepal has been one of them, but yeah, Nepal. I, I mean, there, it's yeah, and yeah. Ho Chunk Nation here has right. the rights of the Manuman rice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So this is really, and the United Nations has a, a page, uh, a, a section devoted to rights of nature and all the uh, provisions that have passed, right, since um, since almost the beginning of, uh, of this concept there, even before. And yeah, so uh, just want to mention that there. I forget what, I don't know if, Marky, you know exactly what that's called there, but I know there's a section of the United Nations that uh, has that in it, about Mother Earth and something like that. Yeah, I know they do their um, harmony with nature. Harmony with nature, maybe that's what they it's conference called. Conference every yeah. Um, I think they've they've done that for I think the last twelve years, mm -hmm. at least under that title. And I'm sure there's been work going on um, yeah. beyond that as well. But yeah, you mentioned uh, about uh, the indigenous people. There's a lot of wisdom there. They've learned how to live and uh, with nature and not destroy it. And this is indigenous people throughout the world. And how that, that wisdom, that knowledge is, is very important with this, this movement there, isn't it? Yeah, I think that's one of the ways we try and keep ourselves grounded to the idea, keep the integrity of the idea. As Tish mentioned, like there's a lot of room for this to get co-opted and watered down. Um, but the more we have local voices and indigenous voices informing and shaping you know what this looks like and how we carry it forward the the more um, you know whole we keep the concept and it is it is a struggle because we try to coexist with sort of our western ideas and and bringing this in and and you hit the realization that you know what can coexist and what has to be dismantled and rebuilt um, I think that's sort of the struggle that a lot of people have in in moving this forward because we're we're challenging our own mindsets, our own sort of like colonized minds and this Western way of thinking, and we're we're trying to bring this in, but we also want to be careful um, and and try and, and keep the integrity there. But I also think we we don't want to put the responsibility on indigenous cultures and and yeah. indigenous people to say like, hey, you know, we've we've displaced a lot of this knowledge, we've displaced people, we've, you know, just wiped out any sense of, of what this looks like. Um, but now that we've made a big mess of everything, come back and show us how to fix it. You know, like we have to share in that labor and build that understanding together. So, you know, we do wanna be very mindful moving forward, um, but yeah. understanding too, that we've, we've done a lot of destruction to mm -hmm. that, that way of thinking. And um, it's going to take some time to, to rebuild that. Yeah. Uh, Marky, since uh, you, uh, Libor, the uh, Lake Erie Bill of Rights was in the film, can you give uh, our, uh, the people who, who are joining us an update of things that have happened since, uh, uh, you know, beyond what the film has, has uh, revealed? 
Sure. Yeah, I know it was it was so funny because everything was unfolding while they were filming. So it'd be like, oh, we have another update or we have another update. And it would just <laughs> like at some point we have to we have to just put this together. Um, but yeah, you know, the, the film kind of leaves off with the federal lawsuit and Libor getting overturned by this one judge because the state doesn't like it and this one, you know, corporate entity doesn't like it. Um, so there's, you know, a lot we could discuss there. Um, but following sort of that court case, we also had three residents here in Toledo who had petitioned for Libor file um, what's called a pro se lawsuit, which just means that they aren't represented by an attorney, they're representing themselves against the state of Ohio for violating their rights by interfering in, in this local democratic process. And um, this is filed in state court. And originally the, the lower court had ruled in favor of the state and the three residents appealed that decision. And I believe it was in the fall of 2020, um, the appeals court ruled in favor of the residents and sent the case back to the lower court stating that the people actually did have a claim to make and that the lower court needed to hear the case, um, which was a, a surprise, I think, to all of us. Um, certainly, I don't, I don't put a lot of faith in like what the court says goes, but I think it, it's a way that people are still just pushing back, you know, and that's, you, you got to push back a little bit on that. Um, so there's, a, a, I think, a hearing date for that case in, in February of 2022. So you've got some time before that's going to play out. And certainly, you know, the pandemic hasn't helped grassroots organizing anywhere. Um, it's, it's been hard to keep that momentum going. But people are still really plugged in. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't see this as the end of, of Libor. I know I think sometimes you watch the film or you hear the story and you think, oh, it didn't work, it failed. But, you know, we were told no by the Board of Elections up front and we weren't even allowed to be on the ballot. So the fact that we even made it to the election, I think is, is huge. Um, you know, it, it, it's a big deal that, that we got to that point and we just kept saying, we, we reject you saying no and we're gonna keep pushing for what we want. We're gonna keep making a, a scene and making a big deal about all of this stuff. You know, and this entire movement is about engaging in that cultural shift so that we can inform the courts. And, you know, so I can't take the current position as my standard for what's, what's right and what's wrong. Um, and I, I see a lot of power now for people here to keep challenging and saying, you know, the decisions that are made here locally, um, you know, we're going to be really mindful. We're going to be watching what happens. And if we feel that those decisions, those projects, anything that you're proposing would be a violation of the rights of Lake Erie, then we're going to push back, whether that law is on the books or not, you know, because it's, it's not about having it black and white. It's, it's about <laughs> what we're being an, an advocate for. So there's still a lot of power in this that we have locally, but even in, in a larger sense of the movement is that when people see our story and the way that it, it's unfolding and you know, like Tish said, we, we wanna do this too, right? No, we saw what happened with Libor. Yeah. We wanna do something for the Ohio River. Um, and it's about building on that, you know, and, and you know, bracing it and saying, I'm, I want to be an advocate for the change I want to see, even if I know that the road is really uncertain and really unclear. And I might, I might know that I'm up against every sense of, of opposition that you can think of, but it's too important not to do it. Yeah, well, first of all, I see it as creating an awakening of people that this is even an idea. And then right. also, like this mentioned, what about other communities that are depend on Lake Erie, if they start adopting these things too, maybe even in Canada, well, on the Canadian side, that's going to add more pressure. And uh, people have to be reminded of movements. And mm -hmm. movements cause uh, systemic change, and they don't happen with one or two things. We don't know what's going to really change them, right? But it's that keep pushing, keep pushing. And uh, when I think about um, movements there, I, I was struck by a quote that uh, Ben Price made in the, in the film. He said, it's not an environmental movement unless it protects nature as a rights bearing entity. So uh, when we think about movements, 
that's really what they've done is expand democratic rights. We look at the right the abolitionist movement expanded, and the civil rights movement expanded rights to African Americans. And we look at the uh, suffragette uh, movement who expanded rights for for women. And we can look at the labor uh, movement expanding rights to workers. So these are all about expanding. Now we're talking about expanding rights further to what the system that we depend on, right? Which is nature. So yeah, what about, uh, you want to say anything more about this movements and how that's kind of where we're, we're looking at this thing and uh, moving forward. Yeah. Chuck, did you want to say something? Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to pick up on that. I think that Simply Living is very much about the transition from where we are to an ecological future with ecological values. And, that, and we see, we connect the dots between all the different aspects of sustainability. So for example, you mentioned, Bill, the, the food and Vandana Shiva uh, and another great movie coming up soon. We may want to do it. Uh, but the, in extending that, think about the health and wellness people who are recognizing that the food system is poisoned by, you know, so you've got a whole bunch of people who are recognizing that, whoa, something's wrong with the, with the ecological systems that are poisoning us and affecting our health. Uh, and the people involved in the uh, renewable energy recognize that, yeah, it's the ecosystems that are being, you know, the fracking, the ecosystems that are being destroyed. And again, they see that connection then. So the rights of nature, there's a confluence of different groups, different aspects that are seeing that uh, the connection between their movement, their issue, and the need for the rights of nature. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have some questions in the chat. I don't know if that's... Yeah, okay. I see one so far here that... Uh, um, and uh, before I uh, get to that, that question there, I just want to mention, uh, or I just want to ask Tish this, that, uh, that uh, most community bills of rights include rights of nature in their language, like our Columbus one does, and most of the ones that deal with the... The community rights, uh, the community bills of rights that deal with uh, environmental issues. So why is that? That why do the community bills of rights also include rights of nature uh, as part of them? Yeah, well, I think that just ties back to you know the whole idea that you can't really separate um, nature from the community. So when we say it's a you know <laughs> that the environment of the community is part of the community. And I guess the um, one example I usually give about this is, um, that people can relate to because we hear this all the time and people talking, especially now with COVID, right? Like, oh, we have to go out and be in nature. Like that's a, a good thing for us to do. And so we go to the parks, let's go to the parks to be in nature. And, and a lot of the efforts and some of the protection, you know, the activists have worked on in Ohio and other places in the country are about protecting the parks because we go to the parks to be in nature. And so it's really evident to me how that's like the separation there. Mm have in our minds and our culture, our laws, and that it's ridiculous. I mean, if we step out of our dwelling, wherever we are, our homes, our apartments, whatever, but you're in nature, there's nature all around us. We're, we are nature, we're part of nature. But this idea that perpetuates that, you know, that separation. And so for us, when we write a community bill of rights about, you know, people having self-governance, you know, in the local community, well, obviously the environment is all part of that. So rights of nature has to be included in there with the rights of the humans in the community. Mm, yeah, makes sense. So the question, uh, one of the questions uh, that uh, came from one of our uh, or one of our registrants here is, what are your thoughts on the 2015 Ohio Supreme Court ruling that favors state law over home rule, seemingly invalidating local bills of rights? <laughs> you want me to take that first, Marky, and then you can add in what do you really want? Oh, we can discuss a lot about that, I'm sure. Yeah. I don't know what I think of it. No. It's a family show, right? No. Yeah. <laughs> kidding. Um, well, again, that just comes down to who gets to make the decisions, right? So mm -hmm. charge. Is it, you know, like in Marky had mentioned, one single judge up there? And we all know we call it a corporate state that we live in, so that when corporate interests are actually 
kind of controlling our entire government from the legislature to the um, the uh, administrate the executive branch too, and that includes the judicial branch. Mm -hmm. so, you know, I mean, courts ruled in favor of slavery. They ruled in favor of not granting women the right to vote. They, you yeah. know, ruled in favor of separation um, issue. You know, civil rights and all that. I mean, when education, on, yeah. yeah, when Rosa Parks sat on the bus and went before the judge, she lost. Mm -hmm. she so, you know, we shouldn't be that surprised that judges and legislatures are passing laws because what it means, actually, I see that as a victory. So when mm -hmm. legislatures are passing laws to stop us, like in Ohio and many other states, it means you're actually attacking the system where it, it's afraid. I mean, it's got fear because otherwise, I mean, they don't stop people from going to regulatory hearings. They're yeah. fine with that. I mean, you yeah. don't laws saying oh we're going to limit it to five people it can go to the regulatory hearing no that's fine just keep going so you know that's what i'm saying you're really attacking them where the power is because this is really about a shift of power that's what rights of nature is about mm -hmm. so when they're passing laws to try and stop you i kind of tell people you know they get all upset and i go no it means you're on the right track <laughs> yeah. well and, and that brings up the other uh, another big big issue is preemption and People can say, oh, well, they've ruled, so is it too bad, but they've ruled that we can't pass our local minimum wage uh, laws or uh, oil and gas uh, uh, issues uh, to ban things or um, gun uh, rights or puppy mills or you name it, they keep expanding and expanding. Now they've got one where a uh, community can't uh, say no to natural gas. Uh, so it's like, how much are we going to take of this stuff? And, and people can't just be, uh, just say, well, that's the law. If, if, if we all thought that way, then we, we would still have slavery and we would still have all of these injustices, right? Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is corporate interests like Alec, they're actually writing these laws and mm. then pulling them from state to state to state. So the same thing we've seen in Ohio, you know, in Florida, those people show me and go, oh my gosh, the legislature just introduced this bill, you know, and it's a pre, and I'm like, oh yeah, the anti-protest bills are a really yeah. good example of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, those were written and they're just making the rounds to all the different states. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Just another uh, example of why, we, like you said, we live in a corporate state and that's why I want to encourage people to uh, sign up for our next film. In this film, you might have seen that there were segments from uh, the the corporation, which was a movie in 2003. Well, we're going to be showing in August the new corporation, the unfortunately necessary sequel, and very powerful about what's happened since then and uh, why we have to get control and we can't just keep taking it. Uh, and uh, do all we can, because mm -hmm. all democracy is, is, is lost if we, if we don't fight back. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wanted to uh, let you, Tish, talk about, um, uh, since I, the movie was pretty up to date, but I think some other things have happened with Grant Township uh, since the movie, if you like, one or two things there. So can you give a little update on that? Yeah, I'm trying to remember where the movie left off. Um... Grant, um, so we know that the DEP, the Department of Environmental Protection, sued Grant Township. That was in 2017, and they were trying to invalidate the township's home rule charter, which banned the injection of the fracking waste. And DEP, so that's their state organ, you know, state agency, alleges the charter, again, preemption, is preempted by Pennsylvania has an oil and gas act as well. Well, Grant filed counterclaims against the state and asked the court to declare the, um, and then asking the court to declare that the charter was valid law, sorry. And they used their environmental protection rights amendment, which they have in their state constitution. They're one of the few states that actually has anything about the envi environmental protection in their constitutions. Um, and so they're using that, the, the township trying to use that. And they're saying that the DEP, the state failed in its duty to protect them under that constitutional act. And, you know, 
they've sought DEP, the state has sought several times to have grants counterclaims dismissed. And in 2020 spring, and I think this was in the movie, they the yes. state rescinded the permit finally for the fracking injection well. And they actually cited in their case that the charter was the reason why. So they validated the local law. Yeah. In February 2021, PGE, so that's the company that wants to inject the waste, um, they intervened on in, in the Grant Township lawsuit against the state, but on the side of the state, obviously. So that's the oil and gas company. And then in March 2021, Seneca Resources, another oil and gas company, has also filed a petition to intervene in the case. And um, that is pending. The case is scheduled for trial in October of 2021. So, you know, issues in the case are, you know, again, the preemption that you just, we just talked about. And do municipalities actually have a right to, yeah. protect, you know, have the right to clean air, clean water, preservation of the natural environment using the Pennsylvania's constitutional amendment when they're not enforcing it. Um, and then, you know, is the grant charter constitutional to the extent that it enforces, it allows the trustees, you know, of the township to enact duties and, and, and laws using that state constitutional amendment. So if the state's not gonna do it, and we have the right to pass laws to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned about um, also uh, constitutional change too, and maybe you can speak about that. A lot of people may not know that uh, we have a couple of proposed, but of course we've got collect signatures unless we can get some representative to introduce two state uh, constitutional amendments here in Ohio to advance uh, community uh, rights. And uh, also Pennsylvania has at least had some people introduce theirs. So maybe you can let people know about those amendments. Yeah, I mean, again, this isn't any single, you know, we know that, that a movement isn't about one single, you know, I hate to use the word single bullet, but I can't think of anything else right now. Um, it's gonna come along and save, you know, and, and fix everything. And so it's a multi-pronged strategy. And so obviously the local initiatives are very important because if you have more and more communities pushing and pushing um, for rights of nature and local self-governance and you know all these different things, um, police accountability and minimum wage and all those, it all helps more people get educated and understand. And so that pressure then can push up to the state level. But at the same time, we also realize at the state level, you know, you want that also introduced because some people seem to give more credibility to it and you know will listen to it more and pay more attention. So using also that forum if we have it. And so yeah, Ohio is one of the states, the Ohio Community Rights Network did introduce language. It was approved by the ballot board um, and it's on the Ohio Community Rights website if you wanna see it, but it does recognize um, rights of nature. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Pennsylvania is pushing for that, the um, state of Oregon, New Hampshire, they've had it introduced into their legislature several times. Mm -hmm. And of course, they're not going to pass the first time, but it, you know, again, it's pushing and pushing, like you mentioned. So. Yeah, Chuck, you had a uh, Yeah, I just on. wanted to uh, comment that in Columbus, we have a suburb, Bexley, which has recently banned single use plastics. And again, home rule. It, you're not supposed to do that from the state level's perspective. So you, you by pushing back and just doing it, uh, the mayor s sat down with the major supermarket there, Giant Eagle, which is uh, and negotiated an arrangement to uh, stop the passing out past you know the endless rows of plastic bags to handle groceries. It's just an absurdity. And uh, but you just go ahead and do it. And I just wanted to comment on you know. Tisha's remark that, you know, you need to keep pushing back. Gandhi said, you know, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you. Oh, that's ridiculous. Then they fight you. Well, then you win. Yeah. So that's the, <laughs> that's the sequence of change. And, uh, you know, we just have to keep pushing back and be glad they're fighting us because we're taking it on. We're going to yeah. win. Persistence, definitely. I think, uh, the, let me just give a quick explanation of the common sense, I think, 
what these and they're very short these two uh amendments they the first one for the right of local self-government says that communities should have the right to enact and enforce local laws free from state preemption as long as they're not taking away rights granted to real people not corporations natural people under our Constitution, U.S. and and Ohio Constitution. So you know they can't pass some kind of provision that's discriminatory or something like that because that takes away rights of people. So most people say, yeah, that that we should be able to do that. I ask people, well, what about if somebody wanted to come into your backyard and put some poison and dump it there? Do you think you, that's okay? Well, no. Well, then why can't why should they be able to do that in your community? <laughs> and most people can you kind of get that there. And uh, what the other one there has to do with um, uh, initiative and referendum there. So um, let's see, Marky or Tish, you want to just tell people what that one's about there, our second uh, constitutional proposed amendment. Yeah, I mean, that one's pretty short, but just saying that we do have the right to um, exercise that that democratic power and that right to go out into our community and petition for the change we want to see and, and be advocates for the change we want to see. Um, and I, I think right now, not every part of Ohio has that. Mm. Um, you know, there's, I don't, I don't remember the what number. Is it, uh, is it uh, townships and, and people who live in counties who don't have the right of initiative and referendum? Currently? Yeah. And that's yeah. almost what, half the people in Ohio? I'm not sure. It's something like that. When we had calculated, it was about 42% of the population. Wow. That's so, a lot. So it was a lot, yeah. Mm -hmm. Don't yeah. have the same rights that other people do that live in municipalities. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, why should they be denied? Yeah. And it's, <laughs> it's, it's funny because when people are like, well, oh, how do we get started? Um, you have to sort of go back and say, well, you know, my process might look different from somebody else's and we could be in the same state and, you know, where I live, changes the rights that I have. And mm -hmm. it, so there's no like magic formula or like cookie cutter process that you have to follow to do this stuff. And I think part of, of this is to try and, and get everybody to the same, the same point. Yeah, well, it starts with organizing, isn't it? Organizing a group of people uh, who are for something, a cause that's bigger than them, what they, want, they think is important and just. Well, what's interesting is in Ohio, they're fighting us now to have initiative and referendum. And people don't understand, you know, and I, I, talking a lot more to indigenous people and the culture that, you know, they pass along information from generation to generation, which our settler colonial <laughs> culture doesn't, isn't so good at. Um, you know, what, what's the first thing we cut in education is, you know, history glasses, right? Yeah social studies, you know, and so when you don't have that memory anymore, but it's like we, the reason, you know, initiative and referendum is a tool for the people to use um, to legislate directly. So when your government is no longer representing your interest, you have a representative government, but the people on the whole say, you know, it's not representing us. They came up with in the early 1900s, this idea of a tool, which was initiative and referendum so that the people could, um, mm pass laws directly, um, alter or reform that government, you know, that you don't think is in representing you anymore. That's the way to do it. So what we're seeing is more and more communities that have attempted to use initiative and referendum, they're now, you know, pulling that back and trying to take that right away. The legislature is actually passing laws and slipping them into other bills, so no public debate about it, to yeah. actually strip the people of the right, even in municipalities, of putting things on the ballot. Yeah, yeah, that right was 1912 in the Ohio Constitution, so it's been over 100 years. When you talk about slipping things in, it reminds me of Libor also, that another thing, that sneaky underhanded thing that we discovered was that uh, in the budget bill, the last budget bill, not the one that's coming up now, but 2019, at the last minute, they snuck in a provision to try to uh, negate uh, communities bringing rights of nature, uh, representing nature in in uh, the court system, right? Right, Marky. Yeah, and I think you were you were pretty instrumental in in getting those uh, emails for us and finding out. You know, this was written 
a provision written by the Ohio Chamber of Commerce um, sent directly to a, a representative. Um, I can't remember his name. At the Rep moment. Uh, representative Hoops. Hoops, Hoops. Hoops. And uh, saying, hey, you know, we know this is after the deadline, but if you could just add this to the bill, that would be great. Um, and then just knowing like the struggle that you go through to get on the ballot and check all the boxes and do everything the right way that this can happen. And oh, sure, no problem. You know, and now everyone who's voting on this hasn't even seen that provision. Um, I know when we found out about it, we sat there, Tish and I, we were on the phone with each other going through it, you know, 3000 pages of text trying to find where in this document it even said that. And it wasn't even attached to the public document at all. Um, I think we had to contact a reporter to get a copy of this provision that had been added at the 11th hour. And, and uh, you know, interestingly too about that, the, the, the aide to the representative questioned what this Chamber of Commerce had written saying, this seems really unnecessary. Are you sure this is what you want? Mm. This is the language you want in there. And he wrote back like, yeah, because of the Lake Erie Bill of Rights in Toledo, this is necessary. Um, so, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty jarring, but it also, I think, made us feel like, oh, we're, we're a legitimate threat. We have a lot of power here. And look at the, the steps they have to take. You know, they have to cut corners to cut us off, you know, and, and to try and stop us. And that if we didn't have those emails, it would have looked like this was a legitimate act, you know, this was put forward by someone we elected, someone who represents us. And it was, and it was put forward by industry at the last minute in some closed door deal. So, you know, I think that that speaks a lot to um, what, what we do and, and the impact that we have, even if we don't get the result that we want, um, we're, we're making an impact. Yeah, yeah. I'd like the people to know that. Well, first of all, in our budget, so many things they stick in there have nothing to do with the budget, like preventing people bringing uh, rights, uh, fighting for uh, ecosystems in a court. What's that got to do with uh, the budget? And mo there's so many provisions that they s stick in there at the last minute. Where's the transparency? Where's the democracy in that? The people don't even have a say. And in fact, we tried to find out initially who inserted it, nobody would admit it. Right. And, and so I had to do a public records request. So I encourage people to learn how to do that, to find out first, who did it? And then right. secondly, I wanted his communication. And so I had to do another one. And then that's where we found out that it was the Chamber of Commerce basically working with the Legislative uh, Services Commission to, to write this, uh, this thing and stick it in there because they wanted it. So talk about, corporations writing our rules there's a perfect example right there of it so yeah yeah and there was there were even provisions added in there about um you know oh, you can't bring a, a lawsuit against agriculture if these things are true and it you know and it was really ridiculous items about well if they're if they're conducting agriculture on land that has traditionally been used for agriculture, then you can't bring a lawsuit again. You know, it's all these little things that get built in there as, as like, well, if even if we get that knocked out, um, let's really make sure that we are protected, that industry is protected, and and that they can't they they can't touch us. You know, they Tish, didn't they? Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, sorry, Tish. Didn't they also do the same thing in Florida after Ohio did that? Yep. Yeah, they passed. You know, and that's again back to that whole idea of, you know, we have so many issues we could talk about, but you know, some people believing that, you know, one party's better than the other at protecting the environment. And so in Florida, that was very obvious because on one hand, there was this preemption bill against rights of nature. And that was quietly, you know, being passed in the legislature, but the Democratic Party down there wanted to take credit, right, saying they were supporting, you know, environmental protections and rights of nature, but then they all voted for unanimously to preempt rights of nature laws. So, you know, there's the public face and what they like to portray as politicians, and then what's going on behind closed doors, as you said, Margie, and, you know, and there's no transparency. So, yeah, they'll... Yeah an issue when they want to to get votes or whatever but yeah yeah Sad. yeah 
that kind of access to the mm -hmm. and writing, yeah, it's just incredible. Uh, one thing uh, makes me think about education, and somebody wrote in the chat, maybe if PBS rebooted Captain Planet. <laughs> Uh, I, don't, I don't know the show, but it sounds interesting, but I'm thinking about our relationship with nature and about democracy and these things. We've got to get these concepts to the youth at an early age, because we're all learning this stuff far too late, and uh, they're the ones that are going to push the change. Now, a lot of youth are joining, but I think, what do you think about that? I, think, I, I feel like this has to if we can get it into our schools, has to uh, come much, much earlier so kids really understand what relationship we have with nature and, and what should be our rights. What do you think? Yeah, I think, well, Marky can speak a lot to this, but even in, at the college level. I mean, I know you talked to a group, but we both did this week. I was with Kenyon College and you had another one and trying to talk to the youth, but so many of the programs, even at the universities, are all about, you know, getting, you know, the jobs, the economics and um, training them for, you know, a very specialized job um, that's in this capitalistic, you know, machine. Um, and, and that's a problem. And so, you know, in debt, putting people in debt, boy, that sure has worked. I mean, they were already, Thomas Jefferson was, you know, talking about that as a way to keep the Native Americans and taking their land from them. He had said that, um, you know, sell them whatever they want cheaply on cheap credit, because then it'll be a lot easier to take their land. So, mm. oh, this isn't anything new. <laughs> But yeah, you're right. I mean, it's like trying to get to and they've and they Marky can tell her story about sustainability and the sustainability departments at mm. universities and what you know, how awful that is. So mm. yeah, you're right. We definitely need to get to them sooner before they're already, you know, ingrained in this whole corporate state system. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I mean, hey, I, I grew up watching Captain Planet. So it's not a terrible idea, right? Like, <laughs> maybe that had an influence. Um, no, I, I, it's really, it's hard because there's a lot of pressure that we put on young people. And I remember going through this in college, uh, like, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? And you have to go do really meaningful work and make an impact. And uh, they frame all of that, though, in what your career is going to be, what your job is going to be. And for me, it was like, you know, I remember in grad school, being told that like, you have to go to this open house for a permit hearing for an injection well. And, you know, it was my first protest. So I was really excited to go. And we made us wear these like hazmat suits and face masks, which, you know, was pre COVID. So that was like, oh, wow, this is such a statement and totally different time and, and getting there. And just the signs all said, you know, I want my concern on record. And you know, it was like, well, what, what else do you want? Is that it? <laughs> do, you, do you maybe want them to not, not do the injection well? What is your concern? Let's dig deeper. And we went there and everyone celebrated. And, you know, I kind of felt like, well, is this it? Is this my, my mm. path in the environmental movement? It's just going to be, you know, dressing up and yelling and protesting. And there's got to be something more substantial than, than that. And just two weeks later, my program said, hey, there's internships open at the agency we had you protest at <laughs> two weeks ago. Um, and that, that really just did it for me that th mm. this is not what I want. If my career, my future is to be the one approving the permits. Yeah. Um, and if that's what defines an environmental degree, then you can keep it. And I walked away <laughs> from it. <laughs> you know, I didn't want to be part of that. Yeah. But I think people, you know, young people, especially they're hungry for something different. They, they want to do something. They want it to be rooted in action. They want some sense of certainty in their future. And so far, what they're getting from mainstream, what you're getting from academia, whatever, you know, environment you're in is the same stuff we've been doing for the last five decades. Yeah. And I think there's this recognition of, but that's not working. And they want answers, but the people leading these institutions don't have another answer. Um, yeah. And it's it's hard to break away from those those things that we feel we have an expectation to go out and get the degree, get the job, 
you know, be part of a big organization. And it, it's intimidating to take that on, but I see a lot of people are ready to do that. Um, and the more guidance we can offer and support and, and encouraging, you know, yeah, ask questions, you know, and don't, don't just blindly accept what the teaching says, you know, challenge it. Um, that's such a big key that I think people are missing out on because it's, there's just that expectation of this is how you do things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Jack, go ahead. Yeah. Just, uh, yes, business as usual is a huge, uh, uh, big ship to, to turn. And, you know, it's really hard to get out of the bubble of advertising, capitalism, the whole scheme that we're in. As an educator, I just wanted to add that uh, uh, this is the first time ever that the majority of Americans, you know, want the kinds of things we're advocating. Uh, the majority of people are already here. This is the first time in my life, that uh, my lifetime, that that's been true. And I've been fighting on various causes for decades. And uh, so that's encouraging. And again, to reinforce what Marky was saying, Ohio State University, where I'm retired from, uh, Ohio State uh, just proposed this huge fracking uh, uh, gas plant right on the campus at Ohio State. So yeah, the sustainability, the sustainability uh, crew, uh, they have an institute there now, which has supported this. On the other hand, Neil Drobny uh, is one of the faculty people who started a, a sustainability major. It's now the fastest growing major on campus, and that's a big campus. So a lot of students, regardless of whether it's, it, it could be a sustainability coordinator in a business, and it could be kind of you know, business as usual kind of stuff. On the other hand, the interest is there among the students. And just as in the general population, democracy is breaking out. And the fact that we're having this pushback, like I say, is good. Uh, we have to be persistent, but we also have to do it with a sense of perspective and even humor that uh, is gonna be a process, but we have to do it. There's, this is the time and we have a lot of allies. A lot of groups are seeing these issues and uh, they're, we're coming together to create really a new culture uh, that takes mm -hmm. this stuff for, for granted and we get rid of the political leadership we have and we quit subsidizing all the bad things for the global economy and start rebuilding our own local futures. Yeah, uh, one more before we wrap up and maybe I should have brought this up earlier and I know that this is a big topic, but it's in the film and I, I forgot, but uh, uh, do you think many of our problems, which I feel that uh, it's, it's brought up in the movie, the climate crisis, acceleration of the extinction of species, even perhaps our pandemic, are logical consequences of capitalism, where everything, even nature and life itself, is viewed as a commodity with monetary value to be traded in financial markets. Um, what do you think? I know that's a big one there. But, Short uh, answer, yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I think we we have this need to put that value on on everything and how do you measure it and, you know, how do you keep track of it? And capitalism forces us into that <clears throat> metric of dollars, right? Mm -hmm. even, even in grad school, I can remember when we talked about ecosystem services, it was what's the the price tag on how many pounds of carbon, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, yeah. it's like, you can't do anything without there being some kind of equivalent and thinking that that's the only way we are going to understand the value of this. And yeah. if we can get away from that to say, you know, maybe the value is just, um, you know, being a life support system. Maybe the value is what we get out of it psychologically, spiritually. Um, and if we can shift towards that, then we don't always have to be looking at, you know, but what's what are we losing you know if we if we look at this question of does the loss of a forest outweigh the loss of job creation and yeah. the amount of products we would have available from that timber or a potential profit and you know capitalism would would be like oh yeah you know those things are way more important than keeping this forest but rights of nature offers a totally different perspective and a totally different answer to that so yeah. um it's it's really important to move away from that, or we're always going to be in crisis mode and we're going to wait for the harm to hit us right in the face before we take action. And that's just not working for us anymore. 
Yeah, well, that's a good tie in to why rights of nature is important and why we need a new way of thinking instead of just putting a price tag on lives and forests and things like that. It, it just, how do you do that? It's so artificial, it doesn't make sense. But uh, well, I think our time is, is about up. I wanna thank, I wanna mention, first of all, that, uh, and if anybody has any closing comments, but I wanna make sure I mention that again, uh, please uh, si consider signing up for our next movie. Now that won't be till August, but the new corporation, a uh, very powerful one. Uh, and then uh, we're going to have a, a fourth movie and that will be up to register for shortly, uh, shortly called The People Versus Age in Orange, extremely moving uh, documentary. Uh, any, anybody wanna make any last comments before? Uh, and also please, if you didn't get a chance, you can donate uh, to help us uh, pay for the cost to put these uh, movies and discussions on. But, uh, Anybody have anything else like that? Yep, yeah, we have a plug. Marky has a plug to make. Okay. Week. <laughs> Teamwork. Yeah. Um, yeah, just that on um, the 29th on Thursday, we have the third module in a Beyond Earth Day series hosted by Zelda. Um, mm -hmm. And the, the previous two recordings are up on the website if you want to watch those two. Uh, but it was our way of trying to move away from this one day celebration and you know, how do we move beyond that and, and bring it forward? So um, Chris put the registration in the in the chat if anyone wants to check that out. Yeah, okay. And Chuck, you, you were gonna say something? Yeah, I just wanna make a distinction between neoliberal economics and the global economy versus markets, which are local, which is a very different thing, which creates uh, opportunities within communities, can be very diverse, and almost all industries can be localized. There's, there's only like seven or eight the people argue need to be global or, or at least way out of you know national in scope so keep that in mind there's lots of alternatives to neoliberal economics and different financial models there's uh, the schumacher institute uh, uh, big resource for local economics the institute for local self-reliance has had a great uh, impact on uh, uh, localizing the economies, uh, dealing with Amazon and the large multinational corporations. Uh, there's circular economy, there's sustainable economies, there's uh, why we, we license a corporation to just make money for shareholders. That's, yeah. that's over. We need yeah. to license corporations that are going to do something that's good for the community. Otherwise, why do it? Yeah, we have to be able to revoke their charter too, which used to be right. the case. But, well, thank you, everyone. Uh, this has been a great discussion. And obviously, we have to keep it going, ongoing. And we hope that you will discuss these ideas with the uh, people that you know as well. And thanks for joining us. And uh, please join us in August. And also join for the uh, CELDEF uh, Beyond Earth Day if you can. So thanks. See you thanks, next everybody. time. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.